All right, it's 12 o'clock, 10 o'clock for Olga, so let's get started. Hello, good morning. My name is Kelly McKay, and I am Manager of Learning, Museum Learning at the Museum of Russian Art, and welcome to today's program. This is a virtual artist talk with Olga Volchkova. Olga's exhibition, Nature's Saints, Icons by Olga Volchkova, is currently on view at the Museum of Russian Art in our Fireside Gallery, where it will be until Sunday, March 24th, 2024. Olga Volchkova is an artist based in Eugene, Oregon, and she's originally from the former Soviet Union. As an artist, she trained in the traditional style of Eastern Orthodox icon painting, and she now combines this technique with her love of the natural world and her deep appreciation for plants. Today, she will be talking with us about her work, and then we will have a little time for questions from our audience at the end. So please feel free to enter questions in the chat throughout. They will be visible to me um, and we'll save them for the end. And now I'm really delighted to welcome our guest, Olga Volchkova. So Olga, take it away. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon from Eugene. I'm speaking from my studio in Oregon. And at first, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who helped this exhibit um, to put together and make it happen. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Masha, Michelle, Mary, Mark, and everyone who helped. I had absolutely magical time at the opening, and it was so much love and respect and so many interesting conversations I had with people that evening. So thank you very much for your interest. I'm going to talk today. Um, my 45 minutes would be broken in about three main subjects. Uh, first one is going to be about my training and icon painting technique. Um, second segment is going to be about my inspiration from, uh, from Russia and my Russian village and nature in Russia. And the last one is going to be about plants and nature and Oregon and how it inspires me and how it transforms into my paintings. First, I want to show you first image. I want to show you the picture of um, of my hometown, which is Tver. It's located about hundred miles north of Moscow, and you can see in this picture it's a Volga River and another river. Tverza, that's why town called Tver. Tverza are joining together. And where they join together, there is a monastery called St. Catherine Monastery. And at the corner in the bottom, you can see this kind of a low, uh, short building. Um, and that's where my icon school used to be. So basically, we it was it didn't look like that when I started um, to learn icon painting. It was a completely, completely run down, both church and a building and a territory, and uh, it was just newly started monastery. And nuns were living upstairs in that building, and we were renting the space downstairs. And as a rent, we had to paint one icon for iconostasis inside, inside of a church, one icon for months. Um, I was studying in the icon school. Um, it was, I started in 1992. And now I can show you some parts of a technique 
So this is me. It, that's probably picture is taken in 93. Some painting, some um, version, I think. Just practicing um, one of my first paintings. And on the left, you can see a palette with the egg tempera, different colors, and some other participants, and some work in progress on the back behind me. That's an um, icon I painted maybe 20 years ago. So uh, you can see this is the Archangel Michael. And this particular icon is made in traditional technique, which is real gold, real pigments, real uh, egg tempera. And uh, the way you can identify Michael is by his red horse. And his horse has wings. Like, for example, Saint George, he is always on a white horse. That's how you can see the difference between Michael and George by the color of the horse. So Saint Michael, he is like a chief of the God's army. So he is in charge of all angel, angels and all supernatural uh, beings that God sent to earth to watch humans. Icons are made on a wood base boards. Usually it's like a thin pieces of wood that glued together and hold by these horizontal pieces that are installed inside of this um, board so they can hold all boards, uh, all pieces together. First thing what I do and by the way, I don't use solid wooden boards because I think it just makes it too heavy for transportation and it's much harder to do. So I use much thinner boards, but on a wall, they look like real wooden boards. But traditionally, it's a solid wood. And first thing what I do, I make my glue. I use rabbit skin glue. It's like a gelatin. Sometimes I think about maybe it's cruel, but in the other hand, I think it's good if you use all parts of any animal, not just meat. So if you use all parts of animal, so it doesn't go to waste. So this kind of material, it's right on the skin of the rabbit. Usually it gets wasted, but it could be transformed into glue. To make 10% um, glue, I would take 10 parts of water and one part of um, glue um, and I let it sit for about a few hours and then I use double boiler and cook it till it gets completely hot and even and dispersed um, kind of becomes transparent. Second, to make gesso, which I also make myself and I will explain you a little bit later why. To make gesso, I take 80% glue, so I add a little bit of water. And I use calcium carbonate, which we know as a chalk, or it's called also whitening. So um, I use about one, um, one and a half parts of um, whitening and one part of glue. And um, it's basically like you make um, gypsum mold. So you disperse, uh, put your whitening inside of hot glue, mix it very well and let it cool. And um, you, I also use a little bit of garlic juice. All you need is a couple drops because it's a natural material. So you don't want bacteria to live inside of the gesso. So, and I use a little bit honey, and honey makes it um, plasticity of the gesso um, to increase. This way, it's um, so. If you have to think about this, gesso is a living kind of being because 
if it gets too wet, it absorbs moisture, moisture and make it more flexible or if it gets dry so it's um helps it helps board and um, painting layer not to crack and also it connects board and painting layer very very well so next step i have my hot gesso very warm i use uh, first, I glue with a hot glue, like a, something like a cheesecloth to my board. And then I apply layers and layers of um, gesso, sometimes by brush, sometimes by palette knife. Depends on the size of the painting. And that's why I'm going to tell you why I use this particular gesso and not a gesso you can buy in a store. So whatever, because I tried all kinds of products and all of them are very plasticky. So I cannot carve inside of the gesso, the one in the store. So I only can carve in my handmade gesso. And it's kind of a lot of fun. First I make a drawing, then I carve some patterns. And in the end, I have a result like that. So you can see it gives me some sort of a metallic texture like I was pounding or I was working with a metal. It's a trick. But you can use the gesso for this purpose and I really like this ability of the gesso. Next step would be like you have your gesso, you have your board prepared. It's all sanded, it's very, very smooth. So you start to work with the pigments. It's a traditional icon painting. So you'll take minerals and you grind them to the dust. And after that, you, when you have that very, very um, well dispersed pigment, you mix it with um, egg tempera, which is made from a yellow part of the egg and water and a tiny bit of vinegar. So it's with the vinegar, it lasts longer. It has to be certain consistency, not too thin, not too thick. So it all comes with the practice to you, how to make a right um, consistency of paint. I'm going to show you this segment um, in a very simple example just with the face so this sequence is coming from um, classes that i'm teaching sometimes uh, on icon painting so first you start with a simple drawing like you can see just outlines of the face and i'm going to show you very very quickly how it's all done all layers and then I will go back and I will talk about each step. Here you go. You should watch it now. So, and we're going back right now to my drawing. So first, I've done drawing. Second, I use this needle tool and I scratch my drawing into my gesso. After that, I erase all pencil lines and uh, I start to feel colors inside of my painting. So it's basically like mosaic. And um, the red color, you see, I usually apply under the gold so if you put layer of red under the gold gold um, becomes much much warmer this way and i keep filling these colors i apply gold first layer on you see how thin this paint is and by layering putting another another layer it's very very thin so it has no texture that's why i start very thin pretty much almost like a watercolor texture 
you see how it's now it's much more opaque because it's already at least like three four layers went to this um, base color so next step i apply main lines for my painting this uh, stage is very important and kind of challenging. So this is the first layer of light. So basically I'm building this face as a sculpture by applying light to um, most pronounced part of the face, like which one are closer to the light. And also I'm doing it first layer, second layer, so you can see, I already applied a little bit more colors and also some shadings into the hair of this angel. It's a very interesting word in Russian, shading for icon painting. The word is zatinki. It's like uh, related to the word shadow, tin, zatinki. And light, in Russian for icon painting to in icon painting terms calls prebila prebila. So still applying a little bit more light on hair by adding tiny bit of white each time. So I have a lighter and lighter each layer gets a little lighter than previous one. I have a most of my volumes already done, so I'm applying a little bit skin color, a little red, a little rouge on his um, cheeks and lips and a little bit of white um, around his eyes. And the last step, I finish with, um, with the bright lines and borders. That makes it complete. Next example I will show you also related to icon painting technique. You also start with a drawing. And that's from my class. I call it elements of icon paintings. So this is about landscapes. And I will show you how um, mountains and water is done in icon painting. First, you draw a simple drawing. You fill in with colors. You start to work with um, shading, with the tinky. Then you apply prebila, white. Same I'm applying over here for the water. And here you go. Final details, borders, some small, much smaller elements make it complete. So now we're going to my painting and I will show you um, so that's a drawing for example this is a saint cherry so simple drawing with outlines filled with color and then I work inside of each color so in the end you will see the result like that the same principle Shading, light, finishing lines. Now I'm going to talk about my inspiration that comes from my roots. So this is a village where I grew up with my grandmother. I spent a lot of time over there because it was very close to town. Um, and the best, time, the best thing living in town is to escape to the countryside. So every weekend or school breaks, uh, I would spend with my grandmother. And then that, this is a one of the houses in a village, not mine, but this is a house number 12 and my house is number 32. That's also one of the houses in the village. I'm just showing you this very pretty examples. Even some of them are looking old, but if you do you see how many flowers people are growing because summers are short and most of the year it's dark and um, 
there's a lot of snow. So people really try to use the summer times to grow as much beauty as they can. This is my hometown. This is my home. The, this house was built by, by my grandfather. I think it was like 58 or something like that. Because it was the other house in the same place. And this village from my research is coming from very, very long time ago. I even found some written evidence about um, this village called Sapkova. It's about 10 miles from Tver. Um, the evidence I found from 17th century. And of course, around the village, we have this huge field, very, very high sky, very flat landscape. And a lot of, a lot of bachelor buttons. That's my parents, by the way. And that's how this painting was created. Because as children, we love to ride our bicycles into the fields uh, of wheat and um, find a whole bunch of bachelor buttons and just bring them home. And uh, it was so much fun. And of course, swallowtails, birds were flying all over. And it was a beautiful, beautiful summer. Living in a village like that, it's a constant, constant work. And it's always seasonal. So we collect apples. Or we go for mushroom hunts in the autumn. You can see a lot of porcinis. Some of them birch porcinis. Some of them are aspen porcinis. Aspen porcinis are much redder. I'm a notorious mushroom hunter. I love it more than anything. Or in the summer, it would be a lot of cucumbers to pickle. And I just love the processes, how beautiful it looks. And it's straight from a garden to your table. We can see garlic, horseradish, dill, and it's all going to be transformed into these beautiful pickles. Of course, tons of food is made right there. That's going to be Russian famous piroshki or piragi by my mom with a cabbage filling. In the winter, when there are no vegetables, it always would be like you have to chop wood, you have to stay warm, it gets really cold. And uh, in the end, you can see that little house, it's a best house. So the wood is carried to the best house to actually boil the hot water, to take a bath. And fireplaces, always warm always gorgeous and uh, all animals and humans usually gather around the fireplace. Huge tables, uh, you, you work of course very hard but it's fun to gather with relatives and friends and have um, parties and Russian parties are always equal to tons of food and everyone's welcome. Anyone can come from a village. We have this huge potato field and it's, it's a community effort to plant it and to gather potatoes. You can see me with my relatives um, collecting potatoes. That's how this painting was born. Because I always, I was thinking about Saint Potato and it's a Russian woman who works in a village really hard. So she needs a lot of hands to complete her house tasks. So she, uh, she's holding a spoon, she's holding a spade, so she needs to care of, to care of her chickens 
and um, you can see llama because potatoes, of course, are coming from South America. So llama represents the origin of potato. You can see potato sputniks because potato was the first vegetable that was grown in a space. And it's only up to potato God if we have harvest this year or not. So he's juggling in the sky with potatoes and hoping that we all going to be well fed this year. When you walk in a village, you can always see flowers in the window. Even houses could be very small or very old, but you still, the people still would sparkle them with this beautiful, uh, especially geraniums, because they grow whole year round. So even houses are very poor, you can still see the hope in geranium. That's why I painted Saint Geranium, because no matter how hard life is, if you have flowers in the window, that means things are not too bad. There is a hope. And beautiful fields of wheat surround my village. And um, we would go through those fields when they already harvested to the woods again to collect mushrooms. <laughs> and um, you can see the painting called Saint Wheat. You can see this one at the gallery, um, at the museum. I always think about wheat as uh, they like so, uh, all these pla plants are um, uniformed. So they look like a strong soldiers. All they need it would be just boots to do their job. So they're like strong farmer boys all together. And it's endless amount of them. And of course, um, bread shines upon them. The biggest part of my Russian village life would be spending time in a um, next to the river. So river is basically 100 meters from my house. So in the summer, it gets really warm. You can swim or you can just walk by and um, see all kinds of creatures. And I have my special meditation spot. It's usually covered with water lilies and a cattail. That's how this painting was created. They're always together. So they are the couple. Cattails and water lilies. Always together. This is my great grandmother. So she was a grandmother of my mother. Her name was Katya. I only have two photographs of her. And my mom never met her. Because she had a a lot of grandchildren, by my calculation, at least maybe 16 or 70 even, because she had something like 15 children herself. So for her, and she lived in a different village, and she died when my mom was maybe five years old, so she doesn't remember her. All we have these photographs. What I've noticed by looking at only these two photographs when she was younger and when she was older, the pattern of her dress was always the same. So, and she kind of looked the same when she was younger and when she was older. She's not actually that old in this picture because you can see her younger, youngest daughter. That's not her granddaughter, it's her daughter. So she must be hmm, around 60 years old on this picture. But obviously, very, very hard-working woman. 
So she became an inspiration for my Saint P painting that you also can see at the Timora Museum right now. So this painting is dedicated to all women who've been working in the gardens and selecting the strongest plants and propagating them. For, and um, I was also thinking by looking at the pictures, I kind of look like my great grandmother Katya. And I looked at the pictures of her children and they didn't look like her. They mostly looked like her husband. Ivan, his name was Ivan. So all these women, they would notice. So if they would uh, cross white and purple piece, first generation, it would be only purple piece. So because purple would be a dominant gene. And only skip one generation, the white one would strike, but only in a 25%. So the white gene is a recessive. That's why I look like my great-grandmother, um, great because I have, I am in that small 25% who look like her. That's why some animals are black, some chickens are white, and St. P there was a beginning of um, genetic research that went so far right now, so we can find relatives just by taking a test, DNA test, but it all started with a P. And it's all about genetic. And you can see me in a window, kind of resembling my grandma. And in a village, you can meet a lot of different creatures like this one, one of my favorite butterflies called peacock butterfly. And it only breeds on nettles. Without nettles, this uh, butterfly would not exist. Now you can see Saint Nettles and the plant has so many purposes and it has so many values. A lot of, um, it could be a fabric made of nettles, uh, tea, food, medicine, or dye also made of nettles. And all they need is water. Also, they're very good for animals because the plant itself has a lot of protein. And um, we, when I grew up, we didn't have any like conditioner. So we would make a nettle water. And we would wash hair with a nettle water, and hair, your hair becomes very, very soft. And this is the last picture from my village inspiration. I wanted to finish this chapter with. That's an um, old church near my village, and nature is taking it over. I always say, what nature gives, nature takes away. So nature would swallow everything. All whatever we think our beliefs are, whatever we think is um, has to be built, it will be taken by nature eventually. Next chapter, we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about my Oregon inspiration. And first, when I moved to Oregon, I was thinking, oh, we don't have this majestic ruins of churches. We don't have this old European architecture. But I started to look around and I was amazed how big and how majestic woods are in Oregon. And seasons are changing and this giant oaks, especially in the winter when you walk, walk in a fog, so they look like a giant ghosts of the forest. That's why I decided to create Saint Oak, because it's such a big part of Oregon ecosystem. And this ecosystem is very complicated. 
um, because oak was a part of this um, native people would burn the fields and only oak seedlings would survive. All other small trees would be burned and this ecosystem called oak savanna. So it would be only giant oaks. And why would they burn it? Because it would be much easier for them to collect bulbs. And those bulbs were bulbs of camas. Sometimes in the end of April, early May, you can see in Oregon huge fields under the oaks, cover it with blue, with the star-shaped flowers that look like candles. And the bulbs of them are edible. So they have a starch and a sugar. And they used to be used for native people almost like a currency. So they could exchange these bulbs for other foods. And they would also make flour. They would dry them, they would make flour, they would bake bread. And here in Oregon, people coming back to this uh, processes, and you can find here Kamas bread. And this is Saint Kamas. You can see those bulbs in the middle. They're already baked. They become reddish when they baked. And uh, they look a little bit like tulip bulbs, but they're not only for humans. They are also little rodents like to eat them. And blue herons, they like to eat little rodents. And bees also love camas. They um, collect pollen to create honey. So everything becomes as a circle of interaction. Oaks, commas, animals, insects, humans, all live in harmony and all use certain foods and plants in their advantage, but it's also advantage for all other creatures. Oregon has this incredible old growth forest which is not that much of it left right now. It's only, I would say, it's disappearing so quickly. We all know about um, Brazilian rainforest and people cutting it down and disappearing. But we don't know that Oregon rainforest is disappearing 10 times quicker than the one in Brazil. So when I see these giants, um, I'm just always so impressed. That's about maybe 300 years old Douglas fir. And from this majestic size to the forest floor, where you can find tiny, tiny, tiny little creatures, and all this giant and all these tiny little creatures, they all connect. So forest floor is usually crawled with all kinds of insects. And this little creatures, which are wild ginger flowers. They help all the insects who survive, and they are absolutely essential for the, those giant trees as well. So you also can see this painting at Timora, Saint Wild Ginger. So for me, he is a really Oregonian, sweet and rough um, man, or human being that is covered with insects, with the centipedes, ants, and all other crawling insects, and the rain, and rainbows, of course. Some plants you can find both in Russia and in the northern part of America. You probably have fireweeds in Minnesota as well. And fireweed is uh, absolutely whole plant is edible, starting with roots, especially young growth, and um, flowers and the leaves. So that's a fireweed around my house in my garden. And that's a saint fireweed. 
and of course it's most famous in Russia for its tea. Before tea was coming to um, Europe or Russia, it's only happened in um, 17th century. So people in Russia used firewood tea. So they would uh, ferment it or collect it young and just dry it in the ovens, in, in the stoves. And I just want to tell you that Timora gift shop has a variety of all kind of firewood teas with um, um, buckthorn, some firewood with rose hips, and you can find uh, even more varieties over there. My backyard usually is filled with the dandelions and all kind of wild creatures. I never cut them till the end, till they're completely done. And there are all kind of creatures live in my backyard, not only um, dandelions. I also have squirrels, I have a possum. Um, you can see the squirrel is holding my cup of tea <laughs> I always have the same cup for years. That's my favorite one. And people can make wine out of dandelion and it's called dandelion because of the shape of the leaf. So it reminds like a teeth of the lion. That's why you can see lion. And um, honeys are making, bees are making honey out of it. And um, Hummingbirds are making nests out of dandelion's fluff. And I feel myself like a dandelion in a way because it's a not native species. It's wildly spread all over the world. There is almost no place where you cannot find dandelion. And that's only kind of empires I believe in, in the dandelion empires. That's as a humans, that's what kind of empires we have to build, not what we think about empires right now. And also um, in the background, you can see my house in a village we, because we also have tons of dandelion, dandelions. So I am a useful immigrant, just like dandelion, that provides so much My garden provides a lot of pleasures for me. So we would have a tea parties or gather with friends. I love to bake. I like to make desserts. And uh, of course, I like all kinds of bright flowers. I'm just showing you parts of my garden. And uh, it's also a big, big part of my inspiration. What better to do in the morning than have a nice cup of tea? with your friend. So this painting, Teen Lemon, you also can see at the show. And I want you to notice that they are holding these special cups that were, were wildly used in Russia, in the Soviet Union, um, glass holders with the glasses inside. This way, it's not hard for you to hold your cup of tea or your glass of tea. So these glass holders you can also find at the Timora gift shops. They are very special and they have a lot of histories because these glasses mostly were used in the trains. So this way also your cup of tea is not sliding when train is shaking. So it's much more stable and much more pleasant and beautiful. So Oregon is constantly impresses me with nature and the gorgeous landscapes and reflections. And um, just look at this. I have some favorite spots where I, which I revisit all the time. So in the summer, it would be these colors, clothes, in the early spring, 
you would be completely different mood in the same spot. And you can see those willows with those reflections, they create this kind of a pattern and very nostalgic feeling of um, this kind of a nostalgic fluffiness in those willows. And that's how Saint Willow was born because it creates such a habitat and protects so many animals and insects, um, birds, water plants, animals, because they eat willow bark. They also use it as a shelter. And of course, turtles and salamanders and willow grouse is also hiding in willow bushes. And also you can see that she's covered it with willow catkins, these fluffy flowers in the spring that willows have. Mushrooms in Oregon are a big part of my being as well. You can see morel mushrooms. They are not just for pleasure. They only also, I love to forage them. And you can see nettles and morel mushroom pizza. And all kinds of creatures I find during my hikes. Like, for example, this is a flower of salmon berries and uh, wood frog, tree frog, sorry, tree frog. And that's how Saint Sayusla Spring was created with all these creatures combined together. You can see flowers, you can see catkins, you can see frog. And this is basically everyone I met at that hike. I just put it together, deer, geese, first uh, dragonflies, caterpillars. So they all went into that painting. And then willow catkins. More morels, because they're just so delicate and they have such an incredible pattern. And I also use it, you can see all of these elements and all these creatures I need, I use this in my paintings. So this is a Saint Berberi, or in a native town, it's called Kinikinik, Kinikinik. So Berberi, or Uva Ursi, it's um edible berry, and it was used by native people. Um, it was a part of a smoking mix, herbal smoking mix. That's what they used it for. But also berry is edible. It's also eaten by, by bears and humans. You could make tea or it's herbal remedy. But I was more interested in a forest floor in this painting. And as a last painting I'm going to show you, of course it was inspired by absolutely rich, gorgeous, uh, vegetable production in Oregon. I have this friends who have organic farms. They always bring me tons of vegetables and I like to put them together as a sort of a mandala in appreciation of their work. And in the end, you can see this painting I called the Holy Assembly of Borscht. In the middle, it's a big Borscht plate and instead of apostles I use 12 instead of 12 apostles kind of based on the last supper I use 12 vegetables onions beets cabbage carrots potatoes celery dill parsley tomato mushroom broth garlic and instead of Jesus, there is a Ukrainian woman because she um, presents the borscht as a main dish in Ukrainian cuisine. I also painted sunflowers, of course, because of Ukraine, but also because the oil made 
out of sunflower seeds is highly used in Russian cuisine and in this dish as well. So I want to finish my conversation with all of you. Please, it's perfect dish for the winter. Please <laughs> go to the farmer farmer's market, find all this vegetable and make a good bowl of borscht. Have a good winter and good holidays to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olga. That's wonderful. I, for one, will definitely be making a delicious borscht that is inspirational. <laughs> um, so we will open it up to questions from our audience. And let's see, it looks like we have, you have a question. Um, so you did be, our, our questioner says you beautifully explained your ideas, um, but how do you compose your icons? How do you go about deciding what that composition looks like? Well, it's always different. Sometimes I uh, really need to be quiet and use just one figure. But sometimes I just go through the icon paintings and I would see, like Borscht, for example. Um, I looked at this painting over Last Supper, so it's kind of a, all apostles sitting around the table. And I would say, oh, it's 12 of them. That's about how many ingredients I need for Borscht. So I can totally borrow this idea, but flip it completely in a way. <laughs> or... Yeah, that's a good question. I just, uh, I mean, it all comes from trying. So it has to fit inside of my composition. So I change it. So I move this paint, like I, I move the figure still to my satisfaction. I don't know if I answer it right, but... Um, never know what's going to happen in the end but composition yes i try to build it like solidly in the beginning great thank you um another question will this talk be available on your website i will answer that one yes absolutely um, we are recording and this will be available on the virtual event archive portion of our website so you will be able to Go back and, and return to some of the details if you missed them the first time. Um, another question, you explain the materials you're using, how long will they last? Well, I think they would last a very long time. So far I painted in this particular technique I'm using 12 years ago for first painting or 13 years ago. So nothing ever happened to it because of this magic gesso I use. Because it all bends together so well. Only one thing I don't make, I don't make the base, the wooden base. So it, But it's made in Oregon. It's made uh, from a birch. I use a birch wood. And um, so far, they've been behaving pretty good. Let's hope that they will last for a very long time. <laughs> because the way, if you also have noticed, I talked about technique in the beginning. So after the drawing, I use needle tool and I scratch my drawing into the gesso. So even if painting layer will disappear in a hundred years, the drawing is still will be there. So it would be possible to restore it. It's a really interesting question. Um, another question. Can you discuss your egg tempera techniques? Do you mainly use it dry brush style or do you sometimes spread puddles? And our, our questioner apologizes for not knowing the specific well, terms. <laughs> no dry brush or no puddles. That I would answer. So it's something in the middle. You don't leave puddles because they will dry unevenly. An egg is... Um, natural material so you would have a crumbles kind of it would start to crack those puddles when they dry so because it would be more egg than a pigment 
because they start to separate if you leave puddles. So you need to paint in a very, very thin, even layers. It's all brush strokes. And so first thin layer and second brush stroke layer would be covering the first one. So they would be like crisscrossing kind of. That's how you apply. So you build thin, thin layers of that paint. That's how. Thank you. Um, another question. When was the last time that you were able to visit your village? Last time I was in Russia, right before pandemic, because it was four years ago. House is still there. Uh, garden is still there. My mom lives there in the summer. She is getting old, so I probably, I'm planning on going back maybe next year but I really need to go then but last time it was a four years ago another question and a comment uh, Virginia says I really appreciate the blend of your skills and background with traditional icon painting with your reverence for our natural world your paintings feel very sacred and so importantly relevant to our time and world and I wondered how other traditional iconographers receive your work. Well, I never heard any negative comments. And um, I have friends who paint uh, traditional icons. They still live in Russia. And they, they love looking at my work and actually helping me sometimes. We would have fun to talking about what next should be. They're like, oh, should it be fishes maybe next time? <laughs> Or should it be mushrooms? I'm actually thinking about discovering underwater plants. That's kind of my direction for maybe in the next year I will start to, because I know very little about it. So as most people. No, usually it received pretty well, but again, I cannot say about people who are like believing blindly or believing in a sense, um, hardcore kind of uh, religious people, but I don't think our passes cross so far. That makes sense. Um, another question, a question from one of our museum guides who's mentioning she's had a question on a tour. Um, guests are wondering, do dragonflies on your paintings represent something in particular? They usually represent pollinators. And um, I usually use like different kind of insects. Dragonfly, so many different kinds of them in Oregon. And I'm always fascinated also by the pattern of the wings and how they look so prehistoric. Plus, I have a little pond in my garden and I call myself like a mother of dragonflies, not mother of dragons, mother of dragonflies because they breed in my pond. I've seen them like laying eggs and they're always like circling. So that's where they're born. And uh, sometimes when they get out of the pond, their wings because, you know, they have this skin, so they have to get out of it. So sometimes this old skin would be stuck in their wings. So I used like little bamboo leaf to separate their wings. That's why I feel like I can call myself as a mother of dragonflies. Thank you. Um, a couple of logistical questions. How long does it take about to do one of your icons? And do you work on one at a time or do you work at se on several at the same time? Both. Sometimes I work at one. Um, the biggest one I worked was uh, like three paintings at once. because But they were all related to each other, those threes. I call them three sisters. It's a squash, corn, and beans. In the native cuisine, it's very, very important dish by the way in your beautiful restaurant Owamni the first dish in the menu is the three sisters so I would re recommend you to try it <laughs> it's a wonderful native um, stew um, 
but mostly I worked at one painting at the time. The fastest painting would be three weeks. And the longest, the biggest one, you can see, for example, chloroplast chlorophyll, that one took me about five months. And I think the longest painting I've done so far, it would be six months. But if I would have some commission and they want even bigger and I would actually have time and money, I would paint even longer. It's fun to work inside of details. The more details, the longer. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Olga, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. And, and thank you to everyone who joined us. We really sincerely hope that you'll come visit us at the Museum of Russian Art to view our current exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Olga's work is really incredible, and we'd love for you to see it in person if you haven't seen it yet. Also, please consider joining the Museum of Russian Art as a member. If you have not already, you can become a member at tamora.org slash join. You can give us a call or come visit us in person to join. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to Olga, the mother of dragonflies, and may the rest of your day be joyful. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.